over more than 25 years, there has been a strong and growing partnership, as Devis has already highlighted, between Endry and Congress and Aboriginal Health Services and other Aboriginal organisations in the Northern Territory. There are many people involved in this partnership, uh, as, as Dennis has, has highlighted as well, but the work we've done together has been primarily led by <coughs> Professor Dennis Gray and the strength of the partnership that he, that he has had with, um, with Aboriginal leaders, including his colleague, Ted Wills. Under the leadership of Dennis, Andrew have, has developed a strong evidence base in alcohol in Aboriginal communities at a time when the term political economy was uh, very unpopular in academia because it was so countercultural to the neoliberal and we just seen your, you, you know, what you've ended um, there, uh, Dennis, the neoliberal paradigm <coughs> of the 1997 publication uh, supplying and promoting grog, the political, political economy of alcohol in Aboriginal Australia was very important to community-led activism because it legitimised what we all knew. And that is that there is big money to be made in alcohol and this is a big part of why it is hard to implement policies that work to reduce consumption. This was music to the ears of those on the ground in the struggle against the vested interests of the alcohol industry. Dennis always was there to provide the academic support to the concerns that people on the ground had and alcohol as big, big business was a key part of this. In 2000, Dennis and Tanya revealed the very large variations in alcohol consumption in diff different parts of the Northern Territory for Alice Springs in particular, this enabled us to argue more effectively that we need a differential response to um, address the problem that we should go first uh, with innovative supply reduction uh, measures because we had the largest problem. There's been a huge volume of work that's been done in developing an, an evidence-based policy and practice that has now made its way into international publications and not only peer-reviewed uh, journal articles. All of this makes it harder and harder for policymakers to ignore the evidence and continue to promote popular but ineffective policies. There is more opportunity now than ever before to argue for policy changes based on a more widely known and published evidence base in Aboriginal communities, and this is vital for community level activism. Dennis has also played a key role in the development of effective treatment services for Aboriginal people. In 2007, Endry received funding to implement a research program in six Aboriginal communities looking at applying mainstream evidence and assessing whether such approaches also work for Aboriginal people. And you mentioned that in your work earlier, Dennis. As usual, Endry did things, things differently in the process that was based on collaboration and support rather than competition. Congress worked closely with Dennis and, and Ted again and developed a research pr proposal for what became known as the Grog Mole Alcohol Treatment Program, a 12-month intervention trial. Again, with the credibility and support of Dennis and Endry, Congress was in the right space at the right time following the success of the Grog Mob and was able to capitalise on the largest amount of funding ever on offer to an Aboriginal health service for alcohol treatment. <coughs> Dennis led the evaluation of what then became known as the Safe and Sober Support Service, which continues to this day. Dennis's work has always supported the key role of Aboriginal community controlled organisations. In 2012, uh, 2010, sorry, another really important report, which he was a key author um, on, showed that governments across the nation were not investing in Aboriginal community controlled organisations, but were increasingly expecting Aboriginal people to use mainstream treatment services. Dennis has also led the development of a large body of work that has helped to show the impact that price has 
on consumption, which played a key role in providing the evidence needed to support the introduction of Australia's first floor price on alcohol. The evaluation of the Northern Territories Living with Alcohol program, which ran from 1992 until 2000, was funded by the revenue raised from the Territory excise uh, on heavy beer and wine, led to national recognition as the most successful initiative of this type in the nation. The injury evaluation led by Dennis found that 129 lives were saved over the eight years during which the program ran and, and almost as many million dollars in costs were avoided. The evaluation of the Tanner Creek alcohol um, restrictions further added to the evidence to the importance of price and reduced takeaway trading hours in reducing consumption. The official evaluation of the 2002 Alice Springs alcohol trial by Crundall and Moon contained many serious errors. And if it was not for the fact that Dennis Gray, and we ran to you, we were so desperate, we ran to, to Dennis and you were prepared to stick your neck out and write an academic critique of the report that nothing, was, um, that nothing good would have come from this trial if it wasn't for your intervention. When we need help to make the argument that the evaluation was deeply flawed, it was Dennis we turned to, and it was Dennis who delivered with an academic rigour that could not be challenged. Dennis showed that there was in fact an absolute reduction in alcohol-caused assaults and other injuries. In the afternoons, as measured through presentations uh, to the emergency department, and there has not been a shift, and there had not been a shift in the e into the evening, as the Crundall Moon report had found. As a result of this finding, the Liquor Licensing Commission then elected to retain the 2 p.m. trading instead of reverting back to the 12 p.m. And this is still in place today in Alice Springs. The report that Dennis did also ensured that the lesson about the shift to super cheap port was learnt. And so when political support changed, the Claire Martin um, government decided that something needed to be done in Alice Springs. Restrictions were designed in a way that this time would lead to a shift to high priced um, beer rather than cheaper alcohol. This time when there was a shift to cheap long neck beer in bottles that was acted on, this was acted on immediately and not left as it was in 2002 trial. Again, this was a major recommendation of the critique done by Dennis, which led to a better approach. In spite of all the evidence about the key role that price plays in determining the consumption of alcohol, there have been many that continue to argue that Aboriginal people are different and that they have access to unlimited money to spend. And therefore, unlike all other human beings on Earth, they are priced inelastic, which means as the price goes up, their consumption does not change because we have all this money. We also knew from our own experience that this was rubbish, but the supporters of this view kept quoting a piece of work done by Martin in Cape York. We thankfully, yet again, went to Dennis and uh, he's taken care of that with a critique that has literally blown the conclusion of the Martin paper out of the water. In fact, Dennis found that using Ma Martin's original data, that price has a very big impact on consumption and thanks to Dennis, it now seems that Aboriginal people are human beings after all. As I mentioned, all of this work has played a key role in the support, Aboriginal people, uh, I'm sorry, Aboriginal leaders like myself sorry, like myself um, to argue for the first floor price in Australia which came into being on the 1st of October this year at $1.30 per standard drink. But Dennis has never been about just building an evidence base for the sake of it or to let others get on and implement change. From day one, he's engaged with Aboriginal communities and has used his expertise and academic status 
to advocate for change, along with the community, even when this means leaving the pure environment of universities and journals and getting involved in the messy, passionate and difficult debates. He has been on Talkback Radio in Alice Springs and the Northern Territory too many times to count as he makes evidence known to the general public. In 2011, in typical fashion, Dennis made the most of the opportunity on National 7.30 to highlight alcohol-related harms in Aboriginal communities and support evidence-based policies and the need for innovation and evaluation. He is what used to be called a public intellectual. They are there for the common good of society and to affect change and not just to describe the problem. I've had the privilege of working closely with Dennis on the key public health issue of alcohol over many years, including on key national committees such as NIDAC and the former you know, Australian National Council on, on Alcohol and Other Drugs. He's made a fantastic contribution to addressing alcohol-related harms in Aboriginal communities throughout his career, and his contribution will be greatly missed. I'm hoping we'll be able to call on his expertise in his, in his retirement, which we have from time to time. And in typical fashion, Dennis will continue to provide assistance wherever he can. Thank you. Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, good day, Dennis. Well, look, um, yeah, you could have run me over right before with Simon, but. Um, because I didn't actually prepare, prepare anything, so I know how a busker feels when I go to a, a new train station and a bus. But anyway, look, it has been a long journey. Um, I remember, uh, you know, meeting Dennis uh, probably 25 years ago, because ADAC, the Aboriginal Drug and Alcohol Council that I work for, um, basically started about the same time that Dennis started working at Endry. Lottie is my, uh, if you've been around for a while, you might remember, I was actually on the Endry board for 11 years um, with Professor, uh, Professor um, Tim Stockwell, and I do remember uh, um, Charles Watson as well as, you know, a real old, nice old guy um, that seemed to have a lot of uh, Aboriginal interests at heart. And, you know, I've come over to Perth, uh, which to me, as, as, as I think it was Dennis or Ted said, is like going to a foreign country, trust me. You know, when you're three and a half hours behind, um, you know, and I'm sitting there, you know, I thought I left Adelaide yesterday, it was 35 degrees, and I thought I'd get to Perth, it'd be nice and sunny. Thank God I bought a jumper last night, um, because I thought I was in a different sort of uh, country. But no, it's actually been a pleasure working with Dennis, and I do remember when I first started at ADAC, um, I was the admin officer there, and uh, you know we, we were, were created as a result of the Royal Commission and Black Deaths in Custody as well. And you know, I think 88 of the um, 300 plus recommendations deal directly with drug and alcohol, and so we were sitting there one day thinking about, well, what could we do? How could we make an impact um, as a small community organisation? And looking around and thinking, well, who could we, you know, because we're not, we weren't researchers, um, we were just community people, and how were we going to give whatever we did that academic credibility that what we were saying was actually fact? Um, and I remember the first time that we uh, came across the, the National Drugs uh, Research Institute's um, uh, contacts and we sort of rang up and spoke to Dennis about um, whether there was anything that we could do that sort of might have been able to advance some of the uh, um, recommendations in the Royal Commission. And so it has been a, a, a sort of long journey with Dennis um, and, and a, a Ted and people like that. And I do remember um, a lot of the team, although my memory is sort of going with age, but it's also about you know how you can actually how things might have been different, and what Dennis didn't sort of mention is that I remember sitting down with uh, Dennis, um, uh, Professor Neil Thompson at the time, or, although I'm not sure whether he was a professor at the time, and we were sitting there talking about you know the database and 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 the things that Andrew were doing, and this was even before there was such a thing called the Indigenous Health Info Net. 
and we were sitting sitting there talking about the need, perhaps because we weren't all that sort of computer savvy savvy ourselves, um, and we were talking about wouldn't it be great if there was some sort of place that um, um, you know that all of that stuff could be housed at. Little knowing that uh, Neil was from a different university, um, there was a government grant available at the time, and he actually put a submission in, and that ex eventually becomes the Indigenous Health Info Net. So, if it had to be, if we had been a little bit quicker off the mark at the time, <laughs> it could have, could have been actually at Endry. So, it's funny how you can have little conversations, um, and then they grow into bigger things. And I remember sitting down again with, with. Uh, um, Dennis and, and Coralie Ober and uh, Wendy Casey and eventually that turns into Strong Spirits, Strong Minds. Um, it turns into the Indigenous Risk um, Intervention Scheme, Scheme or IRIS. So all along the line, you know, little conversations that we might have just been having have actually turned into things that are there concrete today and are still there today. Um, that Dennis um, can take pride in, in, and sort of saying that he was actually involved in, 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 even if it was just the, you know, planting the seed that led to the, the health info net, that led to Strong Spirit, Strong Mind, that led to um, Iris um, training that obviously Aboriginal folks still do today, um, and in particular Strong Spirit, Strong Mind. Um, I've seen uh, people that went and did that course, for example, who then eventually went on to Sydney Uni and ended up doing either their graduate, and they were from WA, did either their graduate diploma or ended up with a Masters in Indigenous Health. So there was those sorts of things as well. There was also some of the other things that, uh, you know, like I said, being on injuries board for, for, for that period of time, it was uh, a pleasure coming over here. And, and, and it sort of made me, because I really wasn't an academic or involved with academic life, you know, until I came to uh, over for the Endry board, and it was a totally sort of really weird sort of place. Um, it was this little little building that they had, I think, in East Perth, um, and to sort of get involved in that and see the importance of why you need to have um, not just centres like Endry, but also uh, um, researchers and that like uh, Dennis, and because that sort of gave us the ammunition that we were able to then sort of, you know, take to our funding body to say, no, what we're saying is actually, here's, here's the, you know, the research evidence. And Dennis might have just touched on it a little, little briefly bit, but to me, you know, when we sort of were looking at, uh, as part of, uh, and the funny thing is Tony Abbott was the Minister for Health in those days, um, and, and part of the, you might remember, go back, you know, to the front page of The Australian where you'd see photos of young Aboriginal kids with petrol cans hanging around their, their necks. Um, I forget who the uh, reporter was. Um, but anyway, you know, and that was sort of a regular occurrence. People were dying, uh, not just in Central Australia, but right around the country through solvent abuse and, and things like that. Um, and the government, in their wisdom, would sort of bring in different sort of schemes and eventually they brought in what, what they called the ABGAS or the COMGAS scheme, where they'd sort of place aviation fuel in remote communities as a way of trying to get uh, people to stop sniffing petrol. Um, and the only thing that they could do to sort of change that uh, through Parliament, because it was a legislative requirement, was to actually do an eva evaluation of the, of the COMGAS scheme. And so ADAC... Uh, um, was lucky, we tended uh, to get that uh, uh, grant and then we built a, a research team to sort of do the research and Dennis and, and people like that were part of that. Um, the interesting thing is that actually led to what is now Opal Fuel and to me um, is probably one of the biggest single um, successful health interventions in terms of drug and alcohol amongst Aboriginal folk ever really because almost overnight when they introduced uh, opal fuel in the communities, petrol sniffing to a certain extent uh, did stamp and it did die. Um, and Dennis uh, and, and Ted and, and the rest of the crew at Endry were quite clear, I remember sitting, you know it was interesting because really when you consider I'm one of those folk that were one of your clients not that long ago 
um, to actually sort of sit there and then eventually get appointed by the Prime Minister um, onto the ANCD, onto NIDAC and things like that and actually be at the table because it was interesting in those days that we were part of the, part of the conversation and part of the discussion with government um, and to have somebody like Dennis there with us uh, to back up uh, you know, our community sort of uh, uh, experience and, and what we were doing as community uh, uh, organisations, to have somebody like Dennis to sort of you know, prod us in the right direction to make sure that we always had, a, had an outcome. Like I remember coming over here in uh, 97, 98, um, and then sitting, meeting Ted and sitting down, uh, probably at the first meeting of what used to be called, and it's a long name, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, People's Alcohol and Other Drugs Strategy Reference Group. Um, <laughs> you know, try and get that into an acronym, it's not easy. Um, and people like Dennis were actually uh, appointed onto that committee as well to give us that expertise, as so to speak. Eventually that leads to NIDAC, but in the meantime, it also led to what's called the Complementary Action Plan for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander folk. So it's the actual first uh, national uh, strategic uh, approach um, to try and to deal with uh, um, drug and alcohol for Aboriginal folk. And, and, and like I said, you know, it was people such as uh, uh, Dennis and Endry who led the way that provided us with the, uh, the research uh, ammunition to sort of be able to sort of get that complementary action plan up. And in the second iteration of that, uh, although uh, I think by the time NIDAC um, was disbanded as part of the MyEVO, so you know that's coming up shortly, so look out for what they might get rid of. Um, we had to wait until after NIDAC uh, was disbanded before they, the second one came out. Um, but there was little things like that and also um, Tanya might be able to help me because I can't remember anyway, but there was another uh, major national project that we were involved in where we had to sit there and work out the cost per unit or how much it would actually cost you know, for an Aboriginal folk to, to go and see a health worker to eventually, I think it was a, uh, something to do with treatment. Um, it was called the Duck Up. Duck Up, that's it. it. That's it. With, with, with put an F there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a nightmare. Yes, at the end. So, <laughs> for us, it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, and I remember sort of being locked in that uh, room at Engry for uh, a couple of days, in, in fact. Um, with people like Dennis and that and trying to work out, you know, cost per unit of, you know, little things like that. The fact that, you know, for a non-Aboriginal person, they might have a car, they can go and see their health worker or their doctor, but for an Aboriginal folk, you know, they might not have the car, they might not have the money, so, you know, it was about do we need to get a health worker to pick that person up to make sure they get to this sort of... and to work out what that actually was all going to cost and, and get that all to the DACUP team and sort of, uh, you know, there was a lot of robust discussions in that. Um, you know, the NIDAC conferences... Which, so can uh, I come in there? Because I think that's a really important thing. What we showed was the, the high, much greater cost of providing services to Aboriginal people and governments shelved the report. Yeah. A lot of things we did were shelved. But, um, you know, all I'm trying to reiterate is the fact that if we didn't have someone like uh, Professor uh, Dennis Gray um, helping and supporting and guiding us on, you know, it's great that you've got, uh, you know, William and all of that and, and Andrew Moore and all of that who can sort of say from the point. But I'm just saying that when we were in, get up at that level where we're providing that advice to government, um, you know, we needed the research um, people there as well and Dennis and his team were always there to support us. Um, you know, this, uh, I can rattle on for, for quite some time about, you know, the successes we did at Breaking the Cycle, for example, where we directly sat down with uh, uh, Minister Jenny Macklin, uh, for example, and gave her advice as to where we thought uh, collectively that that uh, 20 plus million dollars could be spent in China sort of... Uh, uh, helping uh, Aboriginal communities and folk and, and whole regions receive uh, funding. That wouldn't have happened uh, without uh, 
people like Dennis, you know, I was a, a member of the, uh, what used to be called the Alcohol Education Rehabilitation uh, Foundation, which is now FAIR. Again, you know, uh, Andrew, uh, I know that they put in through Dennis and Ted um, to help uh, communities such as Southern Metropolitan uh, Aboriginal Corporation, as well as a whole range of other, other places that uh, we did visit. And, you know, it was a really great time. Um, NIDAC went for, for nearly uh, 14 years, roughly, uh, where we, we tended to meet quite often. Uh, we tried to come up with a whole range of uh, strategic advice uh, to, to the federal government through the AMCD. Um, and to see a lot of that sort of, uh, to a certain extent, uh, disappear over the years where, you know, it's almost like you're banging your head against the wall these days to sort of get that, um, um, get that advice uh, to government to sort of perhaps, like Dennis said, uh, you know, with uh, closing the gap. It's sad for me to sit here thinking that, you know, closing the gap is supposed to have that equality in a couple of years' time, but the life expectancy of an Aboriginal male for, in Wilcannia, for example, is 37 years of age. And for a woman, a uh, female, it's 42 and a half. So it tells you that, you know, when government, um, our community and researchers do get together, we can have an impact. And I, I believe that we did uh, through, that, through that period. But then when government uh, chooses to sort of ignore that and, and move ahead, um, which they've done in the last couple of years, unfortunately, the gains that you sort of uh, do make um, sort of, you know, slip back and, and we work in such a, uh, a variety, interesting, at times very sad environment um, that, you know, when you, when you come along and you meet people like uh, uh, Dennis who were able to bring you back into that reality um, and actually refocus, um, you know, that you, you sort of get a bit caught up in, in, in the world that we live in um, because this does, doesn't happen out there, you know, the drug and alcohol that you sort of might read about in your research is actually in our families as well. And so we live and breathe this every day. And so to make us more rounded and grounded people, uh, it's been great. Um, and I, I think I've said that a couple of times and it has been a great journey uh, uh, for the last 25 years and, and I suppose uh, you know, I'm proud that I, I've actually been part of that journey with Dennis at some small um, steps, um, and hopefully, uh, wish him all the all the best. I did actually ask him when he was coming here today. You know, well, what are you going to do now? And he said, starts rattling off all these little projects that he's still, <laughs> still involved in. And I'm sort of thinking, well, what the hell are you? you know, I think you, why are you sort of going off and doing an archaeological dig in Sicily or something like that? Um, but you know, um, like I said, thanks a lot, Dennis, for for the memories, and uh, we wish you well for the future. Someone who just walked yeah, yeah, onto yeah. the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Can't talk as well as Scott. <laughs> um, Thanks, Ted, um, Ted, for the welcome. Um, I'm going to call both of these two my uncles, uh, my amigos, um, my mentors. I've been very lucky, and thanks for having me, uh, for inviting me today. I have some messages from some people as well, so I'll read them in a minute. Um, but I just want to say that, as mentioned by a couple of people here, historically um, and also still today, sometimes research can be a dirty word um, for us mob. And I think it, it's been a real challenge to kind of, especially for Ted and Dennis, uh, you said there was two papers originally, um, and pretty much uh, you and Ted have kind of contributed the majority of that evidence base today. Now. Um, but what a challenge it would have been to be starting to work with communities and our people and try and get us to kind of shift our mentality around research because we kind of wiped it all off for a lot of years. A lot of bad damage was done. Um, so yeah, a lot of us that have kind of ventured into this space, of, we, we kind of haven't known it and I, had, I didn't know it and Ted and Dennis used to tell me all the time, you're, you're doing research now and this is your evaluations that you're doing, it's all research, but you kind of, you don't see it. Um, 
so yeah, unintentionally, I guess, I kind of got into this space um, with a little bit of a push from Dennis and Ted, who kind of mapped out my career for me, um, <laughs> which is a bit of pressure, no. Um, but yeah, I can imagine at times I've been a little bit like flogging a dead horse to get us kind of going in this space, but I'm, I'm really grateful and I appreciate it so much from the things that you don't see and you don't know about, you know, being, being an AI on publications or... Um, sitting at, at committees and, and whatnot, and uh, yeah, so even though we might not see the value of the evidence base and publications, um, I think, you know, you've made some immense and amazing changes nationally for, for people personally as well as uh, workers, organisations, families in our communities. I'm following your footsteps. Right. 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 <laughs> um, you've changed my life more than your time. I haven't been drinking either. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I remember about ten years ago having a bit of a go at Dennis and Ted, one of our conferences, saying, "You need to have youth representatives up there with you, old fellas." <laughs> and uh, having a bit of a go at them, and I remember James Ward saying, go oh, easy on them. I think they've got things in the pipeline. And he said, yeah, we've, we've got some things in pipeline. And little did I know that that, that was me. <laughs> and I thought, how embarrassing, <laughs> once I found out. But um, they'd actually nominated me to be on, on, involved in NIDAC. And people like Ted Chang and Scott, and uh, I go, no, but he's passed away. Don and Wendy Brad from New South Wales. And I can't read my notes. <laughs> but I used to think, when I go to these meetings, what the hell am I doing here? I can barely understand anything these folks are talking about. I don't know anything about this research space. Um, and maybe I should jump ship. But I knew they wouldn't let me do that. So um, I guess it's it's... It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see now how, how much you could see in those days that, that younger people like, like me couldn't see. Um, those bigger pictures, the national focus, and the impacts that that has on, on ourselves, our families, but, but our communities and workers. Um, you know, I think it's so important that, that people like yourselves, and you know, we, we thought you were pretty famous over in New South Wales with our little network. Uh, you'd come and visit us, but, you know, you sat with us, you talked to us, you educated us, and which in turn, I guess, uh, made us believe in ourselves and our voices um, that we, we, we felt weren't being heard. So it was giving us a platform to believe in ourselves. Um, and I've got some messages from people who, who wanted to, to say thanks as well. Brad Freeburn, our, another little famous Brad Freeburn from AMS Redfern, wanted to say that from, from his perspective, as a worker who has worked for an AMS or an Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Service, whose experiences with research has over the years has been one of negative outcomes. I was nominated for a seat with NIDAC sitting around a table in Broome and a number of years ago listening to everyone introduce themselves. And he heard Dennis Gray started talking about a research project. And he thought, F, beep, yeah, beep in there. Oh, he's one of them. And he turned off and didn't really want to listen. But he said, but don't tell you that. <laughs> Whoops. Um, but he said, I, I've come to know this man as being 110% honest, respectful of Aboriginal culture, and has proven it over and over again by his approach with our communities. Can't look at you there, set me off. <laughs> there are three people who I know who work in this field who have changed my opinion about research and research researchers. Professor Gray, you're one example of this. I'm glad that he, uh, he's glad that he can call you an amigo. Well done, this is a personal joke, sorry. Uh, well done, mate. You are well respected in the Aboriginal communities around Australia along with Ted. Enjoy your retirement. And the work you've done for us is appreciated. When he gets time, we'll, the four amigos will still get together. Mm -hmm. 
Martin Neen, who is the chairperson for the Aboriginal Drug and Alcohol Network in New South Wales, sent through a big thank you to Dennis for your support, your sacrifice and understanding of the issues we face on a daily basis in our families and communities. You've earned our greatest heartfelt respect and appreciation for your devotion and commitment for our mob. Steve from Wee Jelly. Sorry, I'm laughing because he's such a character. Um, you guys made the effort to go out and visit these boys, and I think it sat with them for a long time. It sat with them. Like I said, you're famous, but um, you know, you make the effort to go out and see these small communities. Oh, she had a little Thanks for all the support over the years. May the farewell be a happy and joyful one with many more good memories and thanks from us and happy tears. I'm that example of happy tears. Love, Taylor. Uh, Nathan Deeds, who's a manager at the South Coast Aboriginal Medical Service in New South Wales. On behalf of the South Coast AMS, we'd like to thank Dennis and Ted for their leadership, inspiration and time. Dennis, you've given us, uh, to us, the time and dedication you've given to our services working on and around the ground level. You've supported many initiatives and involved our organisation and we wish you all the best. So your support, advice and friendship will be forever cherished. Eddie Fewings, oh, we're getting out of New South Wales now. Eddie Fewings from Queensland, who is also on our NIDAC committee, uh, says, Chris Mick, uh, thanks Dennis for your support over many years. Through Dennis and Ted's support, Chris Mick have been able to position themselves as strong advocates and service deliverers for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people fighting addiction. Dennis's wise counsel will be missed. We will, however, on occasion, be calling on Dennis now and again as needed. <laughs> and that's already happening. That's right. A friend, a colleague, and mentor, God bless and enjoy your well earned retirement, Dennis. Uh, Craig is here with the state from Vacho, Victoria. To Dennis, what can we say other than what a loss to us all in the Aboriginal aid and research sector? You're truly one of a million. You are the true definition of a gentleman. Your heart and soul is as pure as your spirit. It's been an absolute pleasure and honour in knowing you over the years. You will always have a bed for the night in Melbourne. Here's to the brightest future ahead. So that's the messages from some of the mob from around the country. Dennis and Ted. You've been and still are an invaluable resource for worker services and communities. Helping us to make links with the evidence base, even though we haven't valued it sometimes ourselves. Identifying the gaps from ourselves, from our communities, and supporting and motivating so many of us to get engaged in the research space. The ripple effect of your work and commitment has been felt far and wide across our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander countries, communities, and it will continue to do so. Not only because of the hard work you've done, but because we're just not ready to let you go yet. We'll keep cleaning on as long as we can, I'm sure. <laughs> projects here. As stalkerish as it sounds, it's meant in the best possible way. <laughs> uh, we respect and appreciate you more than any words can describe. And we give you a black heart. One of our hearts. Thank you. All of us. Sorry. Oh, I can't keep it together. <laughs> 